with me to the book of Genesis. We'll be at Genesis 37 in just a moment. But I want to teach a little bit this morning on this topic, pushing through the pain to find the purpose. Everybody say it with me, please. Pushing through the pain to find the purpose. One thing that I've discovered in life is you don't get through life without pain. Has anybody experienced any pain in here? Wave your hand if you've ever had pain. Maybe it would be easier for me to say, wave your hand if you've never had pain. And if we see any hands, we'll make sure that you experience it before. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Pain's just a part of life, isn't it? And so with that came, as I started contemplating this this past week, and I thought, you know, God doesn't just allow pain in our life to step back and look at it and say, I wonder if they're going to make it. Every pain has a purpose. But what I've discovered is this, is sometimes you have to push past the pain to discover what that purpose is. So let's look at it just naturally. And we talk about natural pain in our lives. We understand that Pain lets us know that something's wrong, right? If you have a uh, backache, you, you know that you've pulled a muscle or you've done something, and so you try and find out what that something is so you can make it right. When I was in Trinidad, we were working on a chapel outside of a church, a small chapel, and building a platform for the speaker and Jason that wood is green it's not dried out and I don't know if you've ever tried to drive a nail into green wood we tried to find 16 penny nails they never heard of them this looked more like a roofing nail to me it was definitely a 20 penny plus nail and trying to get that into that wood and driving that, I really needed like a sledgehammer. Because every time I came down on that nail, I kept slipping off of the head of that nail and hitting the wrong nail. I did that until my nail, my thumb was bleeding. And I, I had gone in and wrapped it up. And any of you, how many, raise your hand if you've ever hit your thun, thumb with a hammer. Hold it up if you've ever hit it. Now, this is for just a select few. How many of you, after you hit your thumb with a hammer, hit the same thumb again? You have not experienced pain. I had done that after about the fifth time. I found out what the purpose of pain is. It'll make you pray. I was, I was praying, God, please, don't let me hit my thumb again. Please, God. And then I finally figured out that, that, that I, w- I wasn't called to be a carpenter. My purpose had to be someplace else because there just can't be that much pain involved in my purpose. And so, but pain lets us know that something's amiss, that something's wrong. If you have, if you've ever had a kidney infection or, or uh, gallstone, what? Oh, kidney stones. She said gallstones. Okay, she said kidney stones. I, I, I thought I heard gallstones. I don't even know what you feel if you get gallstones. I guess you feel of all the gall. You'll laugh later when you think about that. So, Anytime you experience that type of pain, you know that it needs to be dealt with. Everybody say it with me, pain must be dealt with. But as I started thinking about that, I thought, you know what? There's always a spiritual correlation to what happens in the natural world. And so I discovered that pain comes in variety packs. All pain is not physical. There's some pain that's emotional. And dealing with that, for example, wave your hand in here if you've got children. You understand understand pain in a way that people that do not have children cannot relate to. And that's not a throw off. I just want you to hear me. Because when you have children, 
then you begin to feel all their pain as well. Let your child go through something and it's just like you're going through it with them. I, don't, I can't even describe the level of that, but it's nothing happens to them that does not affect you. It's like you're going through it with them. Having said that, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself a little bit here, but let me, let me just give you a tidbit because this is a good place to insert this. Having said that, you need to understand something about God. There's not a pain you've ever felt that he hasn't gone through with you because he's connected to us that way, that close on that level. Joseph understood something about emotional pain. Do you ever have family problems? Don't wave your hand or point to anybody. Do you ever have, do you ever have family trouble, you know, and all of a sudden that it's like, the, you know, you, you, you want to avoid family meetings or there's, there's just someone in the family that doesn't like you, and no matter what you do to try and get them to like you, you know, we've got in-laws and outlaws and, you know, and all, all this stuff going on, and, and it just can get complicated. Joseph's own, now I had, there were four siblings plus me, so there were five of us, and there were a few times that I thought that in particular my older brother was going to attempt to kill me, but he never succeeded. But Joseph, what did that, somebody said not yet? But God, yeah, but God. I thought they were cheering for my brother back there. I thought, man, what's going on? Where's the ushers when you need them? Okay, no. So here's, here's the situation. Joseph goes to see his brothers, and he will experience an emotional trauma that is hard to explain unless you've been there. His brothers, his own brothers, attack him. They tear the coat off and tear it to pieces that symbolized his father's love. They rip it to shreds. They throw him into a cistern, a, a pit, that, a cistern that has no water, and they leave him there to die. Then Judah comes up with the idea. He said, well, there's no reason for us to, you know, let him die. I mean, he's our brother. Let's sell him as a slave, and, and then that way we haven't killed him. Aren't you glad you're loved like that? I mean, literally, it's like, oh, well, we're going to do something good here. And you, you can't make me believe that when all this is going on that Joseph is not crying out for mercy, that he's not asking them to please don't do this. That as they begin to put chains around his ankles and his wrists, that he's pleading with his brothers, don't do this. Please don't do this. And as the caravan fades into the distance, so do his cries, but his brothers are never moved by them. When Reuben comes back, Reuben is moved, not because he loved Joseph, but because he feared his father. He said, what am I going to do now? What will I tell his father? It hurts when you're rejected. It hurts at a level that sometimes people don't understand when you're written off or you're made fun of or you're made light of. Joseph finds himself working in a field and the heat from the sun is real on his back. The sweat dripping down his face is real. The blisters on his hands are real. His freedom had been robbed from him. The fact that he'll never see his father again is real to him. And he's trying to figure all that out. And in the midst of that, Joseph does something that is just unfathomable. He gives his very best to the person that bought him. Wow. Wow. I want you to think about that for a moment. We have trouble with people giving their best on a job that's paying them. 
How many of you have ever worked with someone that just wouldn't pull in their weight? You know what I'm talking about? You're out on a job site and you're trying to, you know, and you're trying to, oh, let's go, let's, you know. And, and, and it's just not happening. And how many of you, when that happens to you, it, it causes a little bit of a tinge in you that says, really, you ought not do that. I was doing, I was doing a building project in a foreign country, and we were out there in the heat of the sun working and laboring. The pastor's wife was carrying block and setting them up for us. And I turned around and I saw the pastor who we're building a church for sitting underneath the shade tree with some lemonade in his hand. He put the lime in the coconut. He drank it all up. <laughs> he, he, he just kicked back and relaxed and I'll never forget. I saw that and I felt a word come over me. And I, I walked down to where he was, and I didn't say anything to anybody else, but I just slipped down and I got in his ear and I said, you know what? I said, it really doesn't set well with me when you're sitting underneath this tree on your backside and we're up there working. And I turned around and I walked back up. He got a revelation. He jumped up and started grabbing blocks and started, well, you need anything else? <laughs> yeah, I need you to stay on the job for more than five minutes. And so it's, it, it's like an emotional, look, it, it's true, isn't it? When you feel like you've been taken advantage of, when you give your best and you feel like it's not appreciated, and then all of a sudden it causes this emotional trauma in your life, Joseph, in spite of his brother selling him, in spite of having been sold as a slave and his freedom being taken from him and not going to see his father again, he makes up his mind whatever situation. I am in, I am going to give my best. Oh, there's something that happens when you begin to get that kind of a response. My friend, it's not just people you're impacting. You're impacting God himself because God is faithful not to forget your labor of love. Something miraculous happens to Joseph. He went from being out there in that field sweating bullets to all of a sudden being inside the house, yeah. sipping lemonade. <laughs> He's now over everyone. I want you to hear me. But no one can show you compassion like a leader that's been where you've been. I want to say it again. No one can show you compassion like a leader that's been where you've been. Let me remind you what the Scripture said about Jesus. He was tempted in all like manner as we are. He's been where we've been. And he knows how to give that compassion and show us. He helps us push past the pain to discover the purpose and the promise of it. Joseph ends up and everything's going well for him. Have you ever, did you ever have everything going good and then all of a sudden it all falls apart? <laughs> you ever been on a trip before and going down the road and you're talking and everything's going good? You know, we were in our motor home coming back from Pace, Mississippi. It had a great revival going down the road. <laughs> engine was still running, but we weren't going anywhere. <laughs> Rev it up, it still didn't make any difference. Put it in drive, reverse, didn't matter. Drive shaft fell out, broke off. What'd you do? I looked over at Debbie and I said, he'll do it again. <laughs> Just take a look at where you are now and where you have been. Hasn't he always come through for you? Well, he's the same now as then. You may not know how and you may not know when, but he'll do it again. 
Sometimes you've just got to make up your mind. You're not going to let pain take you out. You're not going to let the emotional trauma drag you down. But you're going to keep your focus on Jesus and make sure that you get what he intended out of this process. I don't want to go through pain for the sake of going through pain. I want to get some purpose out of it. Everybody say, get some purpose out of it. Potiphar's wife looks at Joseph. He's a nice-looking young man. She gets the hots for him. And then, I'm just trying to use the new English language version. And, and then he, he ends up, he, he, ends up he, he, he tells her no. Buddy, this will tell you in a heartbeat what happens when you tell a woman no. no he pushes back on her. Now, I want you to get this. I want you to understand this. There's a reason he's pushing back. And it's not because he doesn't like girls. He's pushing back because he understands something about God. And he's saying, look, I've given my very best to God in this whole process. I'm not going to mess everything up now. I'm, I've, I've, I've always given him my best. And, and, and for the first time, I'm not in a field anymore. I'm, I'm at a place of, of importance. And I can't do this and sin against God. His focus isn't on her. His focus isn't on Potiphar. It's not on himself. It's on God. Hear what I'm going to say. If we keep our eyes on God, it'll keep us out of a whole lot of trouble uh, if we'll just keep our eyes on him he rejects her she gets mad accuses him he winds up in prison wow did you ever get to a point where you just had some questions for god we talked last week about questioning god i'm not talking about questioning god i'm just some questions god there's some things i really don't understand here I, I, I mean, one is I don't understand. Why did my brothers do that? Why did, why did, they, why did they do that? Now, I'm in prison now, God. Why is this happening? I've, I've, I've been faithful. I've done all I know. To, why is this happening to me? You ever been there? I'd venture to say we all have. And I want you to understand something. Joseph, from his perspective, is limited by what he can see. God is operating on a different level than we are. And God is moving things into place that you have no clue about. And when he gets done, it's going to be checkmate, game over. You win. You win. He moved everything in place, and Joseph can't see it. And when you can't see it, if you're not careful, you begin to allow the pain you're in to question the purpose you have. And instead of pushing past the pain and then allow the purpose to reveal, we camp out in the pain and the purpose is blurred because we can't see it anymore. You can't act like pain isn't there. Pain is real, but so is God. And if you let that pain drive you to God, you're going to find out what the purpose has been all along. He goes to prison. In prison, he finds all of a sudden he discovers that God had a purpose for this all along. Everybody say, he had a plan. Joseph had no clue that for his dream to be fulfilled, this was the path he was going to have to take. Any of you ever go on a trip before? Wave your hand if you've ever been on a trip. You get your route planned out you got it all planned out where you're going to go you know you're going to florida you're going to the mountains and you've got it planned out and you and then you get up there and there's a detour i got a problem here because this is the only way i've ever went i don't think you can get there any other way i can't What's this detour about? See, we are creatures of habit. We get so used to things being just right and just like this. And, and it, you know, nothing can change. We gotta, it's got to be just like this. And when, when all of a sudden there's a roadblock and there's a detour we got to take, we get all bent out of shape, especially when Siri doesn't pick it up. <laughs> and Siri's going, go straight, go straight. 
and you grab that phone and you're looking at it and you say, you, can you see that? I can't go straight. I got a roadblock here. There are times that the only way you're going to be able to navigate your journey is to quit listening to everybody else and get your ears tuned into God and let him speak to you and give you the direction you need to go. Joseph did that, and when Joseph did, he found out that his pain was all a part of the process. In Genesis 50 and 20, let me tell you what's happened. His brothers come now. Joseph now is no longer in prison. He's second in command in Egypt. He's risen to the top. I mean, you can't even write a story like that. That's something like Hollywood would come up with. God beat him to it. And it wasn't fabricated, it was real. He took a boy that was 17 years old and he grew him up in adverse situations. He grew him up experiencing 13 years of pain. And through the process of that pain, he set him on the throne of Egypt. For what purpose? to save his family if you want your family to be saved we got to quit questioning the pain push past it and see the purpose pain will cripple you pain will keep you from looking up you have to hold on to god when you don't understand and just keep believing anyway his brothers come to him they didn't recognize him at first, and when he reveals himself, they're in a mess, man. They think, oh, buddy, this is over. We, he's going to hang us out to dry. But listen to what Joseph learned in this process. This is powerful me. In Genesis 50 and 20, Joseph speaking, he said, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so I could save the lives of many people. Oh, that ought to make you shout. What I'm saying is this, is your pain has not been for nothing. It's not been in vain. It's so that you can have an impact on the lives of many people. So go ahead and raise your hands and say, God, thank you. I don't, I don't enjoy what I'm going through. It don't feel good to me. I wish it was over, but I'm not giving up. I'm not quitting. I'm not running off. I'm going to go through it because I know once I get through it, you're going to reveal yourself in it. Sometimes you're just born into a painful situation. You know what I mean? Children born to addicts, they never took a drug and they're addicted when they come into the world. And they have to be weaned off of it or it kill them. It wasn't their doing, it was the doing of someone else. But they're suffering for it. They're going through it. Listen to this scripture in Exodus 1 and 22. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people, throw every newborn Hebrew boy, boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. Talk about discrimination. <laughs> every boy. He is born, Moses is born with a death sentence on his life. Born to die in a river. That's a painful process. Born into a painful situation. Born into a family that doesn't love you. Not Moses. I'm talking about our situations now. Sometimes we're born into a painful situation, into a, a family that doesn't love us or care about us, that harms us instead of helps us. But through that process and, and all the pain and the anguish that you're going through, there's a God that loves you. There's a God that cares about you. And I tell people all the time, you've got to understand that God is not your earthly father and your earthly father is not God. God always loved you. God always cared about you. He's always had a plan and a purpose for your life. Amen. And he will see you through it. He'll bring us to that situation. Moses knows the pain of being separated from his family. His mother has to put him in the Nile. She can't keep him. There's some things you just got to let go of. How many of you have tried to hold on to something? I remember I was out a few years ago 
water skiing. That's what they told me I was supposed to be doing. I discovered that you're supposed to be on top instead of underneath. Because I wouldn't let go of that rope, man. I was, I was hanging on that rope. I had a death grip on that rope, and they were dragging me under the lake. When I finally let go of it and popped back up, the guy circled back around. He said, Rick, he said, man, if you go under, you can let go of the rope. I said, well, you told me I was going to pop up. I just kept waiting. <laughs> I thought this was part of the process, man. I drank I don't know how many gallons of water and had a couple fish on the side. <laughs> just, you know, and, 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 and because I, I didn't know how. Some things we just don't know how. And we've got to let go. Somebody, I'm going to hang on, I'm going to hang on. I'm gonna, uh. Thank God he finally cut the motor. Because I wasn't letting go, and I thought, man, he's either going to get me up or I'm going to run out of oxygen here in a minute, but something's got to give. We have to learn how to let go. We get a death grip on stuff, and we hang on to it and hang on to it at our own hurt and our own pain. And Moses' mother found out it's, it's only when you let go and you let God that things change. As a matter of fact, sometimes you have to say goodbye to say hello. Sounds like a song, doesn't it? Would you say that with me right now? You have to say goodbye to say hello. It was when Moses' mother said goodbye to Moses. When Moses' mother delivered him up to God, God delivered him back to his mother. <laughs> oh, you didn't catch that. Moses' mother put him in the Nile and gave him to God. Pharaoh's daughter found him in the Nile, and then all of a sudden, Pharaoh, Moses' sister said, you need me to find a woman to nurse that baby for you? She said, yeah, gave her the baby, and Moses went right back to his mama and was nursed, and she got paid for nursing her own son. <laughs> Only God can work that out, folks, I'm telling you right now. Got paid to nurse her own baby. And then she had to let him go again. But see, she learned a principle that when you let go and you let God, God will always bring it back to you. When he, he will always bring it back to you. And so Moses grows up in Egypt. There's a purpose for Moses being in Egypt that his mother did not know. He wasn't going to get an education where he was. Not in a poor Hebrew's house. So God put him in the highest education system in the world. He was educated by Egypt. Egypt taught him how to read and write. Egypt was fanatics when it came to their history. They wanted to know about every pharaoh, and I thought about this. What does God do with Moses? God lets Egypt educate them and then brings them back, and Moses writes the history of the creation of the world. God knows what he's doing. But there are only so many things you can learn in a palace. Moses finds his people being, he goes out one day, he's a grown man, and he finds a Hebrew being beaten by an Egyptian, so he kills the Egyptian and buries him in the sand. And he feels like, this is what God called me to do. How many of you ever felt like God called you to kill somebody? You know, we do it all the time with our words. Just bury someone in the sand. And Moses then, he, he finds out he's been discovered, and he flees. He runs. He goes from being pampered in the palace to being a fugitive in the desert. And he stays in that place for 40 years. Somebody say 40 years. You have to understand this. There's only so much you can learn in a palace. As a matter of fact, some things you can't learn in a palace. Moses was going to have to learn how to lead 2 million people through a wilderness and you can't learn that in a palace. you got to get out there in the desert where things are. So after 40 years in the desert, everybody say a painful experience. He felt the pain of failure. He felt like, I've blown it, man. I've screwed up. It's over for me. Anybody ever been there before? 
felt like it was too late, that it was done, God was done with you. And man, he goes from that situation to all of a sudden, after 40 years of feeling like a complete failure, he encounters God in a way he never seen God before. I want you to hear me. When you're willing to go through the pain, it's going to reveal God to you in a way you've never known God before. As a matter of fact, Moses is introduced to God in a way no one had ever been introduced to God before. Let me remind you what God tells Moses. Moses sees this bush on fire and it's not consumed and he just starts to walk up to it because he doesn't even have a clue that God's in it. Anybody ever been there before? You didn't even think God was in what you were going through. And then he revealed himself to you. And the voice of God spoke to Moses and said, take your shoes off, son. Where you're getting ready to step isn't like where you've been. This is holy ground. Your, your, your experience, your journey just took a complete shift. And you're getting ready to walk in some territory you've never walked in before. You're getting ready to see some things you've never seen before. And you're getting ready to get introduced to me in a way you've never known me before he speaks to Moses and he said to Abraham Isaac and Jacob I revealed myself as El Shaddai that's how they knew me as a mighty God but son I'm getting to ready to reveal myself to you in a way they never knew me I'm going I'm, I'm getting ready to tell you who I really am are you ready for this Oh, yeah, I, I'm still Al Shaddai. I'm, I'm the Almighty. But you need to understand, I am Jehovah. I am Yahweh. I am that I am. I am the self-existent one. I am the unmade maker. I am the one that has no beginning and has no end. Nobody props me up. Nobody empowers me. Nobody tells me what to do. I am that I am. And check this out, and I am on your side. <laughs> I'm telling you right there, that's worth all the pain, buddy. That's worth, that's worth the process. And so it, it changes everything. Somebody say, it changes everything. Paul talks to us about pain that changes our hearts. Everybody say, a change of heart. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 7, 8, 9. He's dealing with a, 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 a church that's having problems. And I know it's hard to believe that churches have problems. 2 Corinthians 7, 8, 9. Paul speaking. I am not sorry that I sent that severe letter to you, though I was sorry at first. For I know it was painful to you for a little while, now I am glad I sent it, not because it hurts you, but because the pain caused you to repent and change your ways. It was the kind of sorrow God wants his people to have, so you were not harmed by us in any way. Somebody said, Pastor, you hurt me. Did it help you? <laughs> if it helped you, then I, I, I'm sorry I hurt you at first, but if it helped you, Amen. praise God. Because the pain had a purpose. How many of you have ever, man, I'll never forget this as long as I live. Where were we at? No, I'm kidding. We, we were in Hammond, Louisiana. Jonathan is, what is he, two years old? Or he's not even, is he two? Yeah, in Hammond, Louisiana, which, hang on, you'll get there. Hammond, Louisiana. He's like two years old. He got a splinter in his foot, and it was swollen up, and his foot was hurting him real bad. And, and he said, oh, don't touch it, Daddy. Don't touch it. Don't touch it. Mama got a hold of his foot. Is it coming to you now? Oh, man, ask him about it. He'll never forget it. <laughs> Mama got a hold of that little boy's foot, and she saw what was causing the pain, and she inflicted more pain. 
And literally, I'm telling you the truth, I'm sitting there looking at her thinking, man, leave the kid alone. No, you know, just, just, you know, but she knew she had to get out uh, what was causing the pain. She grabbed that foot and man, she started squeezing it. That kid, ah! Daddy, daddy, daddy. And then I'm, I'm, man, I came real close to pinning mama down. Let, let go of that boy. Let go of that boy. And, and, but, but she knew she had to get it out. You've got to hear what I'm saying. God knows that sometimes the only way to get it out is through a painful process. And he loves us so much that he refuses to let it stay in there even though we're screaming. I'm, yeah, he's fine now, honey. <laughs> it only took 30 years, but he's fine. No, I'm kidding. Pain has a purpose. Let you know something's wrong. I told on her, I'll tell on me. Later, his foot's hurting again. This time, it's an ingrown toenail. I had a friend who was a dentist. Ingrown toenail cavity, same thing. <laughs> the dentist agreed to give him a shot, but I had to do the operation. So we put his foot up on the table, and the dentist gives him a shot and a toe, and I start in. Voompa, voompa. No, I, didn't do that. I start, I start cutting in, and I, I get a hold of that ingrown toe nail, and I, I rip it out of there, and then I start it. You know, and man, it's a mess. And so I'm, I'm cutting back, and I, I look deeper, and I said, son, I see something white. I'm not sure if it's part of that toenail or your bone. <laughs> Seriously, that's what I said. I said, but do you want me to go after it? And he said, well, Dad, I didn't come this far to leave part of it in. He said, you know, get it out. Just get, he'd been in pain for so long. And, I, and honestly, I was a little unsure of what I was going after, but it was part of that toenail, and I had to dig down deeper, man, and I got a hold of it and managed to get it out and ripped it out, and when after I ripped it out, his foot was still numb, so I took alcohol and poured all over it, and usually when you do that, you go, ah, he couldn't feel it, and here's the thing, is that by doing that to him, the next morning, he woke up, and he was able to walk normal. His foot wasn't sore at all. I'm telling you that God is not going to let us limp through the rest of our life. He's going to get down to what's causing it. He's going to dig it out. He's going to try and make it as, less, as least painful as he can. But there are some things that you just can't get through without pain. Everybody's saying the process. You have to push past it. Paul had experienced this type of pain himself on the road to Damascus. He felt the piercing sting of having fought against God and not even knowing it. You remember what Jesus said to him? He said, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. The word prick there means a pointed object a sting. And he'd been fighting against Jesus. And he didn't even realize he was fighting against him. And now it's just up in his face and, and, and he falls back. He's blind. He's thinking, how many of you yeah, sometimes you needed God to shake you up to get you to see the way things really were? And so that's what God did to Paul. But that pain served as a driving force for Paul to share the good news no matter what it cost him. Listen to this in 2 Corinthians eleven eighteen. 18. And since others, this is Paul speaking, and since others boast about their human achievements, I will too. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they descendants of Abraham? So am I. 
Are they servants of Christ? I know I sound like a madman, but he, what happened is these people came in and they were boasting themselves up and saying Paul was nothing. And Paul had finally got fed up with it and he thought, man, I know this is going to be a painful process, but I'm going to tell you the truth. I want you to know what's going on regardless of what it cost me. He says, I speak like a madman, but I have served him far more. I have worked harder, been put in prison more often, been whipped times with without number and face death again and again. Five different times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and day adrift at sea, I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced danger from rivers, from robbers. I faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as from the Gentiles. I faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. I have worked hard and long and during many sleepless nights. I've been hungry and thirsty and often gone without food. I have shivered in the cold without enough clothing to keep me warm. Wow. And you thought you had a bad day. Now listen to this. Because all that pain had a purpose. Paul's pain opened heaven to him in a way no one had ever seen it. 2 Corinthians 12 and 2. I was caught up to the third heaven 14 years ago. Whether I was in my body or not, or out of my body, I don't know. Only God knows. Yes, only God knows whether I was in my body or outside my body. But I do know that I was caught up to paradise and heard things so astounding that they can't be expressed in words. Things no human is allowed to tell. I, I want you to... Get a hold of that for just a moment and, and ponder what that means. See, when I looked at that, I started thinking about everything in Scripture that I've seen that's so powerful, that is right there for the reading, parting the Red Sea, man, taking down the walls of Jericho, all these things, shutting the mouths of lions and quenching the fire, all these things. But Paul said, I saw something like I'd never seen before, nobody's ever seen, and it would be a crime to try and describe what I saw. No eyes have ever seen this. No tongue could ever tell this. And I thought, what kind of glory did Paul see? What was it that Paul saw that consumed him? This is what he says in verse 7. Paul begins to explain the purpose of the pain because of the surpassing greatness, extraordinary nature of revelations which I received from God. For this reason, to keep me from thinking of myself as important, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to torment and harass me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might leave me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My loving kindness, my mercy are more than enough, always available regardless of the situation. For my power is perfected and is completed and shows itself most effectively in your weakness. Therefore, I will all the more gladly boast in my weakness so that the power of Christ may completely enfold me and may dwell in me. What was Paul saying? Paul said, I could have boasted in all the revelations that I saw. But because of the revelation, I had some experience, some pain. Pain was what prepared me for what I was going to see because God knew that I might get lifted up in myself if pain didn't accompany it. And he said, I sought God, man. I wanted God to take this away from me. I sought him three times, and he said, the Lord spoke to me and said, my grace is sufficient. I got to tell you the truth. I looked at that, and I was studying this, and I thought, God, that, that word sufficient just seems like it's not enough. I mean, sufficient, you know. Well, how, let your wife ask you how her cooking is, and you say, oh, it's sufficient. <laughs> You're going to be eating TV dinners the rest of your life. I thought to myself, I said, there's got to be something about this word that we're missing. And there was. I love this. Here's what the word sufficient means. It means raising a barrier, warding off Satan's attack. 
What was he saying? He's saying, my grace will raise up a barrier and ward off the devil's attack. My grace is always there. My grace is always available, and it's always enough. To You may not be able to keep the devil from coming back, but the grace of God can back him off. The grace of God can put him in his place. And Paul said, I learned how to walk in the grace of God. If anyone understands pain, is familiar with it, it's Jesus. Listen to Isaiah 53, 3 to 5. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and pain, acquainted with grief. And like one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised. We did not appreciate his worth or esteem him. But in fact, he has borne our griefs. He's carried our sorrows and pains. Yet we ignorantly assumed that he was stricken struck down by God and degraded and humiliated by him. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our wickedness, our sin, our injustice, our wrongdoing. The punishment required for our well-being fell on him. And by his stripes, wounds, we are healed. Jesus didn't want to experience the pain. In Gethsemane, he's praying, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. He's trying to find a way out. But he understands that if this is the only way for my purpose to unfold, then I'm willing to yield to the pain I will push past the pain to find my purpose. They come in the garden for him. Peter whips out a sword and starts hacking off ears. And Jesus looked at him and he said, what are you doing? He said, put that sword back up. Don't you realize that if I called out to my father, what's he saying? He's saying, God hasn't forsaken me. God hasn't left me. God hasn't forgotten me. He said, even now, if I called out to him, he would send more than 12 legions of angels to free me. But how then would the scripture be fulfilled? What's he doing? He's saying, I'm not doing this for me. I'm doing this for you. I'm going to rescue you. And so they beat him unmercifully. They plow his back like an open field. They put spikes through his wrists and his feet. They shred his flesh until you could shine a light in his chest and see the rays of light coming out. And he hangs suspended between heaven and earth. Unrecognizable. Isaiah said his image was marred more than any man. And through all that, he senses that it's almost accomplished. He takes a deep breath, raises himself up to try and relieve some of the pain and cries out with a loud voice, it is finished. And do you understand that when he cried out, it is finished, it caused our hearts to cry out, I am free. Come on and give my hand clap of praise in this house today. I'm free because of what he went through. I'm free because of the pain he was willing to push back because his eyes were on us. You got to get your eyes off the pain and get them on God. Because if you don't, then the pain is the only thing you're going to be focused on. But if you push past the pain, you'll find the purpose. God has a purpose. I understand the day is coming when we'll be free from all pain. Revelation 21 and 3 said, I heard a loud shout from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among his people. He will live with them. He will be his people. God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. All these things are gone. Gone. 
But until that day comes, we, mean, we need to make sure that for now, we don't allow the pain to conquer us, but rather let the pain carry us to the one that conquered pain once and for all. His name is Jesus. Remembering his grace is sufficient, always, forever, raising up a barrier against the attack of Satan. Would you stand with me today? You don't get through life without pain, whether it's physical or emotional, whether it's caused by someone else or self-induced. And everything that happened to you wasn't God's will. Some of us hurt ourselves, don't we? But God in his infinite wisdom is able to take every pain you've experienced and work it to bring you to the purpose that he has for you. So this is what I'm going to ask you today. If you're in this house and you've been experiencing the pain, pain of disappointment of heartbreak, pain in your body, pain in your heart, pain in your mind. I'm asking you to bring that pain today and say, Jesus, I'm going to push past it because I know that on the other side of this pain, there's something powerful waiting for me.